Hi, everyone. Uh, hello, and welcome to the Wild Side of STEAM. Uh, we are going to explore the unusual careers in science, technology, engineering, art, and math at the Smithsonian's National Zoo. My name is Shelly. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. In a couple of minutes, we are going to meet our guests and hear all about an unusual zoo job, veterinary pathology. While we wait for more friends to join the webinar, you will see a quick poll pop up on your screen. Uh, do you know what a veterinary pathologist is? Yes or no? So while you take a minute to submit your answers, I'm gonna go over the format for the webinar today. I first wanna note that we will be showing pictures of animal x-rays and organs. So should this be a subject matter uh, that makes you uncomfortable, please note that. Uh, this webinar is live captioned. You'll wanna locate that CC button at the bottom of your screen for those to appear. Our program will be about 30 minutes with an additional 15 minutes at the end to answer as many questions as we can. Remember, this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you, nor can you see or hear each other. However, uh, there are a number of ways that we would love for you to interact with us. Um, you already saw that we will be issuing quite a few polls throughout the program. Additionally, you will see that that Q&A is open. Please use the Q&A at any time to ask questions for me or our guest um, and try to keep your questions on topic and only ask once. When you open that Q&A, you will see a column with your asked questions and you check there first to see if an educator may have already um, replied to you. And lastly, you will see that that chat feature is open as well um, for you to make comments and to communicate with us. Um, I want you all to right now find that chat and um, tell me where you are visiting from um, and excited to have you here. So I saw Aiden and Amaya said hello. Uh, someone's joining from Tacoma, from Florida. Hi, Mario. Baltimore, Maryland, Annapolis, Maryland, Greenville, Maine, San Diego. Um, wow. Oh, Seattle. More from Tacoma, Washington, New Jersey, Philadelphia. We are just all around the country. That's incredible. We have DC, Virginia, South Carolina. I love it. Lake Los Angeles. Wow. North Carolina, Minnesota, Utah, Salt Lake City, Nevada. Amazing. So um, while uh, you continue to throw in those answers into the chat, I do want to also want to introduce you to the team that is helping behind the scenes. So if you see responses to your questions or your comments, um, uh, we have Erica, Caden, Alexander, and Casey helping behind the scenes. Oh, Red in California. Oh, I saw Shasta, California, very close to where I went to school. Amazing. So once again, welcome everybody to the wild side of STEAM. I'm so thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Callie Holder, veterinary pathologist at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. Hi, Callie, and welcome. Hi there, Shelley. So as mentioned, my name is Callie Holder. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm super excited to be here today. We are so, so excited to have you. Why don't you start by just telling us what a veterinary pathologist is? What do you do for the zoo? Oh, this is a, I just, I love my job. So I'm very <laughs> excited. So my job is to diagnose diseases in animals based off of tissue samples. That could be something from a live animal where something abnormal was seen. So we took a biopsy, which is a piece of a live animal, like a skin lump or a tiny piece of liver that was taken on surgery. And then also anything that dies at the zoo, whether it's part of our collection or wildlife is always looked at by a pathologist. And so we'll take samples of absolutely all of the different tissues from those animals and we'll look at it and try and figure out everything we can about the health of that animal, anything that was making them sick at the time of their death, a cause of death if we don't know. Um, so we do a ton to try to make sure that we understand everything about these animals even after they've died. Wow. So it sounds like a lot of what you're doing are these necropsies or animal autopsies. And I imagine that this gives you a chance to, like you said, look at a lot of different aspects of an animal. And so of course, viewers, here is another poll coming your way. We wanna know which of the following you think Callie examines during a necropsy or this animal autopsy. Um, this is multiple choice. So you can go ahead and select all of the ones that you think 
that Cali uh, must examine? Is it the brain, a heart, stomach, kidney, liver, lungs, glands? Oh, you're all doing so great already. I love this. <laughs> so all of those samples, by the way, I'm going to look at um, both grossly, which means with the naked eye, but also under the microscope. So all of those samples get turned into slides. And this is what a slide looks like. And um, I'll hold it up. And you can see that there's, there's very thin tissue slices. It's so thin that light can come through. And these are stained with special stains. And then I can look at them under a microscope, like I have here, and tell a lot about the goings on of that organ. Inside. All right, so I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see these results. So everyone really got this right. So most people said liver, but it's pretty even across the board. Callie, do you want to give us an answer? Which of the following do you look at? Uh, I, I like to say it's all, it's all relevant. I look at all of these organs on every case. Um, there are lots of organs that aren't even on here that I also look at. So we'll also look at the joint surfaces. We'll, we'll open up the joints and look at those to check for arthritis. We will, um, let's see, we'll look at the inside of vessels sometimes as well. We'll look at bone marrow. Even the color of the bone marrow is really relevant to us. So we're looking at just about everything you can think of. I imagine that these slides and looking at all of these organs, um, you're getting a lot of information that maybe the animal keepers or the veteran, veterinarians aren't getting, right? Because we're looking at them internally. So what sort of information right. do these slides and your microscope and these organs give you? Right, so uh, I get the best view of any animal, right? I get to see not only what it looks like on the outside, which the keepers are going to see, and even the guests can see the outside of the animal. Um, but I'm looking at the inside, which sometimes the veterinarians get to see if they're doing, say, for example, a surgical explore, uh, an exploratory operation into the inside. But I get to see the, every organ in the body, and then I get to look at the pieces under a microscope. So I get the most information that anyone ever gets from this animal. And it's for an animal that has died, that's the last chance we have to understand what was going on in this animal, which then informs what we do with the other animals that we have under our care. So if say, for example, there's an infection, is that infection contagious? Um, are they having an allergic reaction to something that they were exposed to? Anything like that, those are pieces of information that are then used to take care of our living collection. Also, all of these diseases that we're trying to be concerned about, anything that happens in older animals, um, I need to know so that I can tell the veterinarians, hey, um, you're taking care of an older eld steer. These are all of the things that we've seen in old eld steer. Um, that information also goes to other zoos. We take part in a lot of species survival plans. I'll share information from our necropsies and our biopsies to say, hey, we've seen a lot of this in this species. Are you seeing the same things? And that's important because if there's something different about our environment or our care, um, that's, that's relevant to how we treat these animals, but also they may be new to that species. And if we have a lot of experience with that species, it's really important to let them know, Hey, we've seen a lot of this kind of tumor in that species and they can be more alert to it. That's incredible. So I just wanted to backtrack a little bit. You mentioned an SSP. So for our viewers who have not been present at some of our other webinars, an SSP is a species survival plan. So we are an, an accredited zoo by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And we work with all other zoos, not all other, all other accredited zoos around the country and sometimes in other countries as well to ensure the best care and survival and healthy zoo populations of all of these endangered animals. So for Cali, it sounds like you're getting this information from our animals that have passed and you're taking that information. It's not just helping our living collection here at the zoo, but it's helping living collections at other zoos and living, or living animals in the wild as well. Absolutely. And some of our animals that are in our collection are practically extinct in the wild. And there are lots of zoos around the world and in our country that are trying to rehabilitate these species. They're trying to breed these species up so that they can be re-released. For example, our black-footed ferrets and our scimitar-horned oryxes. I mean, these are critical to their ecosystems, 
both as large, uh, so the, the scimitar horned oryxes are a large herbivore, so that has a huge impact on the, the grasslands that they're native to, and we released some back to Chad uh, recently, and it was super great, and there's video on it, so if you want to go to our website and look for that, that's great. The black-footed ferret is a keystone species of the prairie ecosystems and the high prairie ecosystems where they are a big part of um, keeping the prairie dog population in check, and so they're they're very involved in that ecosystem and they're pretty much extinct in the wild. So we're doing a great job of trying to breed them back up and sharing all of our information of uh, any issues that we find in them with other institutions that are doing the same thing. So I think it's safe to say that, you know, even though it sounds like a lot of your job is dealing with animals that have already passed, the knowledge we are gaining from these animals is just so vital for species Absolutely. survival everywhere. Absolutely. I like to think that we are the last stop in getting information, not just that um, that one animal has died and we want to know why, because of course we do, but we want to know how is our nutritional program going? Um, how are we doing on checking for parasites? How are we doing uh, at identifying problems that are infectious? Or what about things that are like tumors? Are those things that we should worry about? Some of our some of our collection is very prone to tumors, right? Like um, some of our clouded leopards. And this is not just us, this is everyone who has clouded leopards knows yeah. that, that they're more prone to tumors. And then you have things like naked mole rats who pretty much don't get tumors very frequently at all, yeah. but we have identified some and that helps uh, other places go, oh, if they think that they don't get tumors, well, guess what they do? And we've reported what they look like and, and so that they can be aware of them because their reputation is they just, they never get tumors at all, do. So you've touched on quite a bit of things here and the common theme that I'm hearing with all of our wild side of steam guests and I have found to be very commonplace in zoos. It doesn't sound like uh, your day to days are very similar that <laughs> days are alike. Can you give us a general run through of what a day in the life of a veterinary pathologist look like. Well, so it depends on what kind of day. So we have two big categories for our pathologists here. There's on duty, which is you are responsible if you are on duty for any cases that come in, whether that be a cytology case. So maybe they're, they've done a, um, a cystotomy, so they've opened up the bladder in a maimed wolf to, to take out bladder stones because they saw bladder stones in there. Well, maybe there's some goo in that bladder. And the techs, you guys have met um, Sosa, one of our techs, Jessica Sosa, she's great. Um, so maybe they'll smear some of that goo on a slide and they'll stain it and they'll get it to me and I'll look at it under my microscope because I'm a pathologist on duty or the pod, as we like to say. Um, or say, for example, there is a piece of skin that looks a little bit weird um, on a siamang and they will take that, uh, a biopsy of that, that animal and they'll send it to me and I will cut it into tiny pieces and put it in a cassette and send it off to be um, read. Maybe I get slides back from um, an opossum who had something going on with its ear tip and that looks weird and I want to know is that infectious? Is the animal healthy? Because opossums are prone to getting ear tip necrosis when they have systemic infections and that's just a thing about opossums. So that's things that I do when I'm on duty. Also, of course, like I said, if anything dies, that's something where I absolutely have to be on site to, um, to investigate that death. So for example, um, a, a really old duck drops dead and its, its keepers are like, he was fine yesterday, what happened? What happened? And I do the, the autopsy and I see, oh gosh, this the heart on this poor duck. Um, has fibrosis, which is scar tissue in the muscle, and that can make the animal prone to basically having a heart attack. And wow. so that was what happened with that duck. Um, that, he was very, very old. Yes. And that's very, like, something that's very interesting from the animal care side is, you know, a constant thing is we do so much training in our animals, but we have not yet trained them to speak English, so they can't always tell us when something's wrong. So from the animal care side to have to go off animal behavior or differences in their patterns and um and they're like so great at it the keepers yeah. and, the, and the curators are so so attuned to their animals and they know what normal is and and they look for things like is this an animal that is super curious most of the time but 
today it's not as interested in its enrichment activities right or is this an animal that usually likes to take naps all the time but today it's just it, it doesn't seem it's, it's a little restless um and those are things that are completely valid symptoms and those get reported up to the veterinary staff and we talk about that sort of thing um so those are things that can can trigger us to go hey we, maybe we need to look into what's going on here so um, before we get into another question, we have a great question from one of our um, viewers right now of whether you have a team of people or are you the only pathologist at the zoo? We have three pathologists and a veterinary technician who is specialized in pathology. Patty, she's amazing. Um, so they're Andrew and Neil are the other two pathologists. Andrew and I are associate pathologists and we report to Neil, who is our supervisory pathologist, which means that he has to do way more paperwork and more meetings. So his job is less fun than ours, but he still does get to, he, uh, he has weeks on duty as well. And he takes cases just like we do. He just has more, more work <laughs> and involves meetings. Um, so you've mentioned quite a few of these little cases that you've had the chance to work on. Do you have a favorite case that you've gotten the chance to work on? Oh, so I, I'm not going to lie. I really love weird stuff and the weirder the better. So some of my favorites have been like our stingrays, which are fantastic. So um, I, I'm hoping that we're gonna see images. So yes, we have freshwater stingrays in Amazonia and, and they are true stingrays. They do have barbs in their tails and you gotta be respectful of those barbs even when they're no longer alive because there's, there's a toxin that is associated with those. Um, and we have really, really great keepers and everything in that area. And they noticed that there were some discolorations on the underside of one of these rays. Now the rays love to bury themselves in the sand and in the substrate. That's just their, their natural thing is to just kind of huddle down in the sand and the substrate. Um, but if they come up against the glass, you can see their underside and that's all soft. The top of them is covered in very rough, scales, uh, they're not true scales, they're actually denticles, which are basically tiny teeth, um, and spikes. So do not pet the stingrays on the top, or at least not our stingrays. There are, there are aquaria that have like cow nose rays, which are a little bit softer, um, but ours are spiky. Do not pet. But on the underside, it's not spiky. It's all very like mucusy skin, kind of like the inside of your mouth, like on the side of your cheek. Um, so it's very, very soft and very like gooey and they noticed that there were some some weird discolorations and some pitting and just it just didn't look healthy so they gave me some biopsies from this and i went oh this looks this looks weird initially i just thought it was just like irritation like it, it poked it with a rock or something and then was reacting to it but then i noticed there were packets of abnormal cells and packets of abnormal cells oh this is great this is this is my favorite visual pun <laughs> Because when I show this to people, I ask them what they think it is. And they're like, I don't know. And I say, it's an x-ray. And then they go, yeah, but of what? And I go, I already told you. And they, and they glare at me for a while. And then I go, well, well, it's a former, former ray. It's a, it's a radiograph of a, of a stingray. And it's dead. So it's an x-ray. And then I get told to go stand in the corner. <laughs> Nobody appreciates my puns, but I love this image so much because it's just so wild. What you're seeing here is the, the center portion of the ray, which is where it houses its brain. And also the things that look like ribs are actually the gill arches. Oh, wow. And then coming out from that central region, you see um, those, those, we'll say they're rays, those, those lines that have little um, bright spots. Yeah. Those are the skeletal elements. These are all skeletal elements, but they're all made of cartilage, right? Because sharks and rays have cartilaginous skeletons. So there's a true skeleton here. It's not made of bone. It's made of cartilage, which is great. And then those dots on the outside, those are the very hard mentioned. Those are the little spikes. Those are denticles. And the denticles are in different sizes. And the big ones are, um, are the dots that you're seeing there. They're very spiky. Do not touch. Um, so anyway, we found that the that the ray that had the, the strange discolorations on its surface actually had a melanoma, 
that was poorly pigmented. And this is another species that people are like, oh, they don't get cancer, they don't get tumors, they, they pretty much don't. And really what it is that we don't look for tumors and cancers in these species as often as we do with others because people just don't do as much science on them, right. which is a tragedy because they are so cool. Um, and I've had two rays that have had um, malignant tumors. They've had cancers uh, of different cell types. And these rays are all extremely old. And if you live for long enough and you have cells, you will get cancer. Um, eventually there will be enough enough things going wrong in your cells that you will eventually get cancer. So if you live long enough, you'll get it. Um, these, these were very, very old rays and, um, and both of them had lived long enough to get cancer. So I had one that had melanoma and we, we actually diagnosed it using electron microscopy. We had to work with the military for this. We sent it up to USAMRID up in Frederick, Maryland, and they did electron microscopy on my samples. Can you, you know, can had, tell us what electron microscopy microscopy is. <laughs> oh, it's so great. So what I normally do is what's light microscopy. Okay. Right? So um, I use a microscope that has a light source in it. And the wavelength of light is small enough that I can see down pretty, pretty high resolution. However, there are lots of things that are even smaller than the wavelength of light. And to detect those, you need something that has a smaller wavelength to get higher resolution. An electron microscopy uses electrons and the uh, basically the absorption or transmission, depending on the kind of electron microscopy you're using, um, to detect differences in um, whatever the, the, the surface that you're looking at. And in this case, we were using transmission electron microscopy, which basically is very, very, very thin sections, tries to shoot it with electrons, and how much it gets absorbed tells you a lot about um, the, the tissue. And it gives you an image that is basically grayscale. And um, so it's a black and white image, but you can see a lot of detail at a very, very small, small, high resolution, very, very tiny things. And what we were able to see was that inside the cells of this tumor, we could find um, the kinds of um, structures that use, that are, are part of the cells making of melanin and the only kind of cells that make melanin are melanocytes. Um, so that's what they do is that they make melanin. And so the fact that the tumor cells were making melanin granules, they weren't actually doing it well. So they weren't getting all the way to the end of the process. So we were able to see with electron microscopy, the, um, the precursor stages of these melanin granules. So that's why it was, when I looked at it under the microscope, wasn't very pigmented. We looked at it under the electron microscope and we could see that it was just failing to get to the end of the process, uh, which is a thing that sometimes happens in uh, tumors or especially cancers. So the, the, the cancers are more aggressive. That means that they're malignant. That means that they um, are invading other tissues. And when they do that, a lot of times it's because they have, um, they have changed a lot from their original purpose. And many of them have accumulated problems and they sometimes stop being able to do normal things. So these were abnormal melanocytes. So they were no longer able to make enough melanin. So under light microscopy, I didn't see a lot of melanin. Under electron microscopy, you can see that they were trying and failing to make melanin. So yeah, so that was one of the lesions on the underside of the ray. You can see how that looks a lot smoother than um than the, than the top surface yes definitely um so we did have a question related to race first of all i did want to say that we had a lot of people in the chat who did love your x-ray joke and pun so yeah. <laughs> you're um, all amazing you can come sit next to me so but you mentioned away with a mask you mentioned that this ray was old enough that eventually got cancer. How old is old enough specifically for rays that you would Yeah, have so different that? animals age at different rates, basically. Um, this case was over an over 20 year old ray. Um, now some sharks can live to like the, the basking sharks and Greenland sharks, right? They can be hundreds of years old. But for this species, which is a river ray, uh, we don't really expect them to live much longer than about 20. And both of these were well into their 20s. Oh, wow. So we were really impressed that they got gotten that old. And that, I think, says a lot about our Amazonian keepers and, and curatorial staff. They do a great job of keeping them healthy. They were also all born on site. Oh, wow. 
So that, I mean, that was a really cool case for you to have been able to, you know, spot this um, cancer on the skin. And again, it was kind of partnership with animal care, kind of noticing. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. We rely so was, much on the yeah. keepers for their, for their keen eyes and understanding of the behaviors of these animals. Um, I know that you probably have a, a whole list of your top 10 favorite cases, but I actually want to give the audience a opportunity to pick their own adventure. Um, there are two other really great cases that you got the chance to tell us about. And audience, I'm going to let you pick um, which one we hear about next. Would you rather Callie walk us through a case of a brain tumor or a never before seen infection? So I'll give you a couple seconds to answer this poll. And um, then we can go on our way. Um, I do want to mention that while I, everyone answers that poll, there is another question in the chat, Callie, Ooh. which obviously this kind of your work on the right kind of helped answer that is whether there's the same job available for marine mammals specifically. This is from so Eric, There are Eric. pathologists who, who, who specialize in marine mammals. They are anatomic pathologists, just like I am. So when I say I'm an anatomic pathologist, I mean, I am a veterinarian, so I went to vet school. I am a real veterinarian, sort of. Um, so like I have a DVM. Uh, and then I did a residency after that in anatomic pathology, which is looking at things under the microscope and uh, grossly in order to see abnormalities in the tissues. Uh, so I did a residency in that. And then I specialized after that residency in non-domestic species. And there are people who do a lot more work in marine mammals, so yes. Um, Judy St. Ledger, who does, who works for or has done a lot of work with SeaWorld, is probably one of the best marine mammal pathologists out there. Um, Katie Call uh, Cosgrove, Colgrove, Colgrove, um, <laughs> Colgrove, I think. I will let Eric do some research on yeah. that. I do want to. Who does push a lot on marine mammals? Most people who do marine mammals don't do just marine mammals. They do a variety of species, but they tend to be heavy on marine mammals. Right. Um, I have also done marine mammals. We have, of course, um, our seals and sea lions here, and those, and we have otters, all of which are considered marine mammals. And well, we technically don't have sea otters, which would be a marine mammal. We have. Um, river otters. otters and river otters, which are aquatic mammals, but not marine because marine means saltwater. So, um, but I have done some of our, um, our seals. Great. So we got the polls, the results back from those polls, and it seems like our audience really wants to hear about this never before seen infection. So. I was so excited to share <laughs> this with you. So this is, uh, this is a wonderful case. It's one of my favorites. Um, and this is a lined flat-tailed gecko, Europlatus lineatus, which literally means uh, Europlatus means tail that is flat and um, lineatus means line. So it's a lined flat-tailed gecko or a lined leaf-tailed gecko. And they are really cool creatures. There are a variety of leaf-tailed geckos. They're pretty big. Um, and many of them are native to Madagascar, which is a oh. wonderful place for biodiversity. <laughs> this case, to give you just a little bit of background, um, was a, a female gecko who'd had a tail drop. Now geckos, like many uh, lizards, can drop their tails if they are um, traumatized or disrupted by like a predator. It's an escape strategy. Um, and she also had started to have problems with her back legs. She stopped, stopped being able to move normally uh, to the point where she eventually stopped being able to move them at all. She was like a color difference between the front and the back of her body. So she was definitely brought in for examination and um, they couldn't find anything specifically on radiographs. Obviously the first thing that we're concerned about is that she might've broken her spine by falling off of something. Oh, wow. um, but there was radiographically no evidence that she had damaged her spine at all. Um, and there was no evidence of like a metabolic issue, but she just wasn't responding to any treatments that we gave her. She wasn't getting better. And so eventually because she was getting worse, we eventually decided to euthanize her so that she was no longer suffering. So on necropsy, I looked at her and I thought, well, she's a little bit skinny um, because she of course was not eating as well because she was distressed. But other than that, there wasn't really a lot that I could put my finger on. So I trimmed in sections of spinal cord 
and looked at that under, well, I trimmed in everything, right? And I looked at everything under the microscope. Um, but when I looked at the spinal cord, I got a big surprise. So I don't, do we have the, I have them under the microscope here that I can show you live or you can see images. I think we have but, both. Um, I think we'll let you show us you live want, on your you microscope. You around this slide? So I, this is, yes, I this absolutely. is great. This is one of my favorite things to do. I'm going to share a thing, share screen. I want to share the Olympus. Go and see if I can get me to here. Oh wow! So this is live on a real this slide on a real under your yeah. microscope. So just to give you some orientation, um, this is the bone of her spinal cord, her okay. spinal column, right? And you can see that there's marrow cavities in there, and these are basically the cartilaginous discs in between the different vertebrae. And then there's more bone on the other side. And then in the middle, this is the spinal cord. Now, I'm just gonna give you a little spoiler, but these little round things in the spinal cord are not normal. They should not be here. Oh, did you just zoom in? I did, I just, I changed magnification. What I'm gonna do here is clean the slide a little bit. <laughs> but I just changed magnification. We're now at, um, about 40 times magnification. Now I showed you this slide, right? I showed you that it looks like this. So yes. you can see kind of how small we're looking at. Wow. Those long rectangular sections are the, the spine that I just showed you. And then the smaller ones are the cross sections of spine. So what we've got in here are these little jobbies here. Yeah, I see those. And that's not normal. That in fact is not gecko at all. Everything else is gecko. Get you some better light and focus. And here you go. Those are not pieces of gecko. Those are a whole different creature. In fact, that creature was a nematode. What is a these nematode? Are, yeah, these are uh, round worms. These are invertebrate worms. Oh. Um, so if you've ever heard of like, if you're, you ever heard of heartworm or intestinal worms? These are, these are parasitic worms. Um, and this is a cross section of an adult, and this is a longitudinal section of a larval worm. So, what had happened here was that this animal had been infected by a parasite that got into her spinal cord wow. and was able to asexually reproduce. So, all of the worms in here are female. And they are laying larvae, or they're, they're giving birth to larvae, even without having males around. So that is a thing that some nematodes can do. I'm going to show you hopefully a longer section. This seems to have been almost like a, um, everything that happened seems to have been weird, right? The fact yeah, that- Yeah, this is a very, very abnormal thing. We, uh, it took us a long time to figure out what this nematode was because um, it hasn't been reported in reptiles before or at least not in geckos. Right. And then this type of nematode has never been seen in any part of the nervous system of anything. This is usually an intestinal parasite um, that doesn't really cause problems in geckos yeah. and somehow managed to get into gecko and get into spinal cord of gecko and just cause a lot of damage. A lot yeah. of this is all damaged spinal cord. Wow. So you know it's broken up, that's not normal. Um, I'm going to launch another poll here because I'm very curious about what our viewers, what kind of science they've used. Um, so I'm going to launch this right now. But while I launch that, Callie, can you tell us why everything is pink on the slides? So um, we use stains to uh, to show. Now, part of it is that this particular stain, um, this particular uh, lab used a very heavy pink on the stain, but all of our stains. Um, all of our, our typical slides are stained with blue and pink. This one's a little bit more, got more blue on it. Um, but yeah, why is everything pink? We use two different stains. They are hematoxylin and eosin. Okay. Hematoxylin is the um, blue stain. And 
the eosin is the pink stain, and the blue is basic and binds more to acidic things, whereas the pink is acidic and binds more to. Wait, is hold on. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so we can the blue, which is basic. Okay. So nuclear, like nucleic acids are acidic, so they bind the blue, which is basic. Um, and then the eosin is pink and it is acidic, so it binds to basic things. So um, this the it stain just, just gives us some contrast in the tissue. The stain helps you look at the different The stain helps me see brain. contrast in the tissue and see different different things about the tissue. So I can identify, for example, if I go down here, and this is now we are at 200 times magnification. Oh, wow. Um, and these blue spots, these are nuclei. Like I said, nucleic acids are acidic, so they bind to the basic blue stain, which okay. is our hematoxin. And just so you know, Callie, uh... 69% of our viewers have said that they have also used a microscope to yeah, explore science. Microscope users. And a lot of them, just like you, have loved all animals and biology and looked at pictures of cells. Um, so that is so great. And I think that really launches us. We have so many questions about your background. Um, Mrs. Percival's class wants to know why you wanted to be a pathologist and how did you get into this career? Um, I'm very curious and I'm very weird. And this is a great place for curious and weird people. Um, the best thing about veterinary pathology is that you will never know all of veterinary pathology. So for a curious person who loves to continue to learn, especially about um, different kinds of animals and different kinds of diseases, this is a wonderful field. I also love teamwork and I work with a great team of people from, like I said, the keepers who are noticing things going on, and they frequently teach me stuff about the, the individual animals, not only their individual personalities, but the species at, as a whole. And then I get to work with a team of veterinarians and technicians who are knowledgeable about things from their experience and everything. Zoos are great because, again, there's just such a breadth of species that you're learning about all the time. So I love that about my job. And, um, I'm a little bit ghoulish. I like to see how weird things can get. Um, I also love being able to, to solve mysteries. The best thing about pathology is that I get the most information of anybody, right? I get all of the keeper's behavioral information. I get all of the veterinarian's uh, clinical information. And then I get all of the information that I've gathered from looking at it with my eyes and then looking at it on the microscope. So I get so much information and I get to tell the story of everything in this animal. So I love this because I get the most information and I get to solve problems. Um, it's really a lot like solving mysteries and, and like teasing apart that sort of thing. I find problem solving very um, rewarding. You like puzzles? I love puzzles. Uh, I love trivia. And sometimes trivia helps me solve puzzles yeah. in, in this job. So that's great. So the, the thing that they say about pathology is it's an inch deep and a mile wide, uh, just, just, to, just to take the test to become a pathologist, it's an yeah. inch deep and a mile wide, which means that we have to know a little bit about everything. And then we dive deep on a lot of these diseases. So oh. this is, it's a great job. I'm always learning. I'm always uh, getting to experience new things and seeing wild ways that, that animals can can come up with uh, new ways to go wrong. Yes. Stop doing that. Like, for example, please do not put nematodes in your spinal cord. That is a bad way to run a gecko. Nobody wants don't that. Don't do that. <laughs> Stop. If you were considering, don't do it. No, they do not belong there. What I have on my screen now, if you're still seeing it, uh, yeah. is a, a piece of the of an adult worm. And um, these down here are the like embryonic larvae. So when when this worm uh, releases those, those are gonna be the larvae that continue to live in this spine. So this was a never before seen infection. We actually needed PCR, which y'all have probably been hearing about from a lot of the, uh, the COVID testing is used PCR. Uh, we used PCR to try and identify this parasite. 
and it came out closest to a Rayleigh Nema, which is an uncommon infection, usually found in amphibians. This was a reptile, not an amphibian, and um, had some other morphological features that, that helped us confirm that this is an, a never before seen um, kind of infection. Nobody's ever seen anything like this wow. <laughs> in, a, in a gecko. And again, just based on, you know, the gecko's behavior alone, they, we would not have been able exactly. to diagnose us absolutely. without our pathologist. Yes, absolutely. Um, so obviously we've looked at your microscope a ton and you're obviously use, utilizing quite a bit of our science, technology, engineering, arts and math, STEAM. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually have a great question from Ryan who was asking specifically about your microscope and how these slides are created or how are they cut? Do you have special instruments or machines that you use to prep your slides and create them? What a great question. So um, the National Zoo currently does not cut their own slides. What we do is send out our tissues in order to be cut. And so what happens is, say for example, I have a piece of liver. What I will need to do is put that into a cassette, which is about the size of a matchbook. Um, so I will cut thin slices. Those are gonna be about mm, three millimeters. So about the thickness of like a nickel. And I will put those into the cassette. And then I will have that cassette sent to a laboratory and they will embed it in paraffin, cut slices and stain those slices. It is a very complicated process, much of which has been automated, which is really nice. But the, basically, the cassette has the tissue in it. The whole cassette will be um, submerged in a bunch of different solvents sequentially. And what happens is that through the process of sequential solvents, you'll, for example, first put it in alcohol, which is miscible, it mixes with, um, with water. And then, um, then they will put it in a, another thing and it will get soaked in an organic solvent, which mixes with alcohol, but wouldn't mix with water. Okay. So now the, all of the water has been replaced by the organic solvent. And then it will go into paraffin, which mixes with the organic solvent, but wouldn't mix with the alcohol or the, or the water. So basically all of the water in the tissue is replaced by um, the, uh, the paraffin, and it has already been fixed because we'll use this formalin. So it's mostly water, but it has some formalin in it. So all the proteins are locked into position by that fixation, goes through the process of the sequential solvents, gets embedded and suspended in paraffin, which makes it rigid. And now you can cut slices. And it's just like a deli slicer. <laughs> you've, ever been, you've ever been to a deli and you've seen that, like they do the thing and it just like cuts off right. little things. That is a, what a microtome does. So micro meaning small and tone meaning cutting is a very, very fine deli slicer. And it deli slices off the front of this uh, piece of paraffin embedded tissue. And then these are five microns thick. The, uh, the, the pieces of tissue are five wow. microns thick. They're so very yeah. And then they go back through that same process to get all of the wow. uh, paraffin out. And then they get stained because the stains are all water soluble. So then the stains uh, bind to the tissue. They put a cover slip on it and then they send me the slides. And all of this process takes, um, for a good lab, it takes about 24 hours. Great. Well, Ryan, I hope that answered your question. That's a great question. We have tons of other great questions, Callie. So um, I do want to ask you, We you do work at the National Zoo. Our uh, mission here is to save species and everyone really has a unique conservation passion. So being a veterinary pathologist, what is your conservation passion? Well, I think uh, this is actually a really good example of my education passion. Um, I think that people will only care about animals when they know about them, and, and people will only be invested in conservation the more they learn. So for me, what it comes down to is outreach and engagement and, and education. So I really think that people need to know more about the science that we do, um, a lot of people think that, that zoos are just animals in cages and really um, good zoos, which I hope that we are an example of. The, we are conservation organizations and we are here so that you out there get to know more about these animals. And the more you know about them, the more you care about them and the more invested you are in working with us to do conservation. Scientists are not the only people who are doing conservation. Scientists are just one aspect of all of us doing conservation to try and save species. 
So if nobody cares about conservation, if nobody falls in love with these animals, if nobody recognizes the importance of these ecosystems, conservation will never have enough resources to succeed. So people need to understand how phenomenal all of these species, from the elephants down to your new Caledonian geckos, um, to be a part of like making sure that we, as a species, humanity, stay committed to the success of the whole future of the planet. That was wonderful. And I know we are at time and I'm going to ask you one last kind of final words and questions. I do want to note that Megan did say in the chat that she just got a microscope. So that is so exciting. Congratulations on your microscope. <laughs> Megan. Um, I named mine, just so you know. Yes. So I hope um, yours gets to be that important. <laughs> so Megan, go ahead and uh, name your microscope and start looking at things. And um, folks, if you do have to leave, that is fine. I am going to launch this final poll. Did you learn something about zoo careers? So if you do have to leave for another class, feel free. Um, but I will launch this um, final poll for you. And Callie, for the last question, I would really love if you have any advice about your journey into veterinary pathology and for any viewers who may be interested in this, any advice for our watchers who might be interested in this career? Stay curious. Learn as much about animals as you can. No piece of information is irrelevant to, uh, to your, your process. Um, but also, learn more about how humans learning. Um, I did some reading when I was in my educational process that was about how human brains take in information, and that helped me a lot. Um, so learn about what habits can help you. Figure out what helps you specifically, because everybody's a little bit different, but there's a lot of great research out there. Um, I recommend the book uh, How We Learn by Benedict Perry, which has a lot of like information about how humans learn and has good advice on how to put that information into practice because it's not just like okay great i read a paper on the neurocognitive biology of that um, it's really useful to understand how it, brains work and how they consolidate information quiz yourself talk to friends about things um, actually trying to explain things to other people is great and they don't have to be people who know stuff about what you're talking about maybe they're just curious maybe they're your grandparent and they just want to hear from you so be like hey i just learned a thing do you want to hear about it grandparent person yeah um, and if you don't want to talk to a human find an animal they they're very good at listening my cat listens to the most ridiculous things about liver biology sometimes <laughs> and he's very non-judgmental in, in as much as a cat is ever non-judgmental of course well callie thank you so much for joining us for the wild side of steam i have learned so much about your career in veterinary pathology um and i'm sure our viewers did as well so again for our viewers that poll is still open i'll close that in just a few seconds um additionally we would love any feedback and comments um, on this webinar so that we can continue to grow and learn um so a short survey should pop up in your browser as um, once you close this webinar um and that will also pop up in the chat for you uh, oh so wonderful i'm so glad that everyone was able to make it thank you all for coming i know that some people have had to leave already but thank you those for everyone who made it thank you Callie. so thank you again to everybody for joining us we spanned the country today and that makes me just so happy um and we hope that everyone will join us for our next installment of the wild side of steam so mark your calendars for friday april 2nd at 1 p.m and we're actually going to get a little snapshot into horticulture at the zoo um so once again on behalf of the smithsonian's national zoo and conservation biology institute we hope you have a wild day. Thanks for joining us.